Okay. Who's coffee drinkers? Anybody a coffee drinker? All right. I don't know. I, I wake up every single morning and make myself a coffee. Anybody else like it's the first thing you wake up and do, right? Every single morning, I make myself a cup of coffee. Now, why do I do this? It's strange for me because most of my life, I have hated coffee. Like, hated it. Does that have anything to do with a mildly traumatic experience in seventh grade where maybe I was at a baseball game, sleep deprived, couldn't play, and someone force fed me a supersized cup of coffee. That was a terrible cup. I don't know, maybe, <laughs> who, who knows if that has something to do with it. But I hated coffee. I hated coffee so much that 15 years ago, my mother-in-law came to me and she was like, hey, uh, do you want coffee? And I said, you never have to ask me again, that stuff is gross. <laughs> Not that she reminds me of that now that I drink coffee every day, right? Because a year later, I went off to seminary. And in seminary, I was studying way too late at night, getting up way too early for classes, and I couldn't sleep. And so I needed something to get me going. And so I started to choke down the black caffeinated sludge of coffee, right? Like just getting it down to get myself awake. And then I started to enjoy it. So a couple months, you know, go by, and I'm waking up and making myself coffee every morning. And I find that in Christmas break, when I don't even need this stuff, when I'm getting pr plenty of sleep that I'm still drinking this brown bean juice, right? <laughs> and to this day, to this day, years and years and years later, first thing I do every morning is I've got to get coffee. I've got to get coffee. Now, why do I do this? Why do I do this? Why do I drink coffee every single morning? It's because it's a habit, right? It's a habit. Right now we're in this message series on what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And last week we looked at how disciples are people who are not standing still in their faith. They're not complacent. They're moving forward. They want to transform and that you transform through training. And so the natural question after that is, if you're trying to define discipleship and what this life of a disciple looks like that we're looking at in this message series, usually we just go through a book of the Bible at the time, right? That's what we always do around here, but we're just taking these weeks to ask, what is a disciple? And so if you said, that's what a disciple, a disciple is someone who's, who's training to become more and more like Jesus, who's transforming into the image of Jesus, who isn't complacent, who wants to grow in their faith. Well, then the question is like, Okay, how? How? Because I think the chief problem isn't that most people who, who consider themselves Christians do not want to transform to be more like Jesus, but that we do not know how to transform in order to be more like Jesus. So what does this training look like? What, what is this transformation? What does it take? Well, if you look at the people in Scripture and you ask, what did it take for them to transform and, and be people of faith that were committed and transforming followers of God, then you'll see that one of the things is this issue of habits. Daniel chapter 6. A few months ago, we did a message series. Do you remember this one? On Daniel chapter, uh, the, all of Daniel. But in chapter 6, we found that there are these bureaucrats in the kingdom who wanted to take Daniel down. He was ascending in, in the bureaucracy. He was a big man in charge. And they're like, eh, we got to get rid of him. So we got to cancel him so we can, you know, rise to his position. And so they sought to get rid of him. And, and they hatched this plan to trap him and tricking the king into signing a law that said in Daniel 6, 9, anyone who prays to any God or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, this is a really, really strange law to pass in a polytheistic, pluralistic society where it was like everybody just can believe what they'd like to say, oh, you can only pray to the king. So why did they do that? Well, it was because they knew that Daniel had a habit. And they knew that they could trap Daniel in to getting in trouble with this law because he wouldn't give up this habit. Here was Daniel's habit, Daniel 6.10. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed. That was his habit. So Daniel was this transforming, committed follower of God, who loved God, whose whole life centered around God, who, who, who was this incredible person of faith because he had these habits. He had these habits, and one of his spiritual habits was that he would drop to his knees every single day in his home, and he would pray. He'd pray. In fact, it was such a consistent habit, such a known habit, that other people knew that he had this spiritual habit and knew that they could use it against him. And Daniel's habits did not change because the law changed. 
When the law passes and it's now illegal for him to pray to his God, he doesn't change. No, he goes home, he kicks the windows open so everybody can see him, and he still prays. He still prays because he was in that habit. And we do what we're in a habit to do. So why was Daniel's faith so strong? Well, he prayed three times a day. He had this spiritual habit, and it was that spiritual habit that was training his soul in order to transform as a follower of Yahweh. And it's interesting, because if you track through all these different characters in Scripture, what you'll see is the people who have the strongest faith, the people who are transforming, the people who, who, who love God, they have these habits. They have these habits they've formed in their life. In fact, even Jesus had a set of habits. Have you noticed this? Have you read through the Gospels that Jesus has these habits of praying? of being about scripture, of retreating by himself to be alone with his father. One of his, his, his favorite habits was, and you'll see this if you look for it, if, if you read through the Gospels, is that he was constantly actually pulling away and retreating by himself to go pray. Like in Luke twenty two thirty nine, 39, he came out and went as was his habit, as was his habit, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. So Jesus had these habits, and the more you study Jesus, the more you see that his spiritual habits were incredible. He was always doing these certain routines that were around God, and and Scripture then makes it clear that if you're a disciple of Jesus, then you're supposed to avoid certain habits, but then have these certain other set of spiritual habits. Here's one of them. For example, Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. Let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds, not abandoning our meeting together as is the habit, as is the habit of some people, but encouraging one another. So here's the biblical truth. Here's the biblical truth. Disciples are transformed. Disciples are transformed by training our habits. Our spiritual transformation, if you're like, man, I want to grow in my faith, how do I do that? Okay, your your spiritual transformation happens through training your habits. A disciple is, big shock shock here, a disciple is disciplined. It's in the word, right? A disciple is disciplined, and you're disciplined by disciplining your habits. Habits are those actions we take in life that we don't even think about. Researchers will define it like this. Habits are your settled tendencies. Do you have some settled tendencies? Do you like get in your car the same way and, or, or, or maybe even pray in the same order? Or, or, there's all sorts of things you do that you have a settled tendency that is a habit. And many of the actions that you take every day, they're not conscious decisions, right? They're not conscious decisions. They're just habits that you don't even think about. Like, do you have to really sit there and debate every time you, you're going to bed? Like, oh, how am I going to brush my teeth? Right? Like, no, you just do it. It's a, it's a habit. A study by Duke University found that nearly half of all of our daily actions are not decisions. They're not challenges. We just do them out of habit. Nearly half. Disciples are transformed by our habits. And our habits are really powerful. So earlier this year, I get to go back to my hometown. We're kind of driving through Kansas City, and I wanted to take my kids to the house I grew up in uh, just, just for them to see it, right? And so they had never seen it. I had not really been back in a couple decades, and so I was like, oh, we're going to go, go to the house I grew up in. And I was like, I wonder if I can get there without Google Maps because my wife will tell you I can barely get home without Google Maps, Right? Maybe you're like me. I use Google Maps to get everywhere. So I was like, I wonder if I can get there. And, and so I started kind of going that direction. And, okay, so if you, if you showed up to, to my hometown, you're like, oh, I want to see you, the house you grew up in. First, I'd be like, that's kind of weird, but okay. But second, I would be like, I have no idea how to tell you to get there, right? Like, I could not tell you the st- I know my street name, but I couldn't tell you the street names or if you took a right or you took a left. You would have to use Google Maps. I would be no help to you at all. But for me, once I started getting in the neighborhood, I was like, oh, yeah, I think I turn left here, and I turn right there, and I knew exactly where to go. Because 20, 25 years ago, it was just a habit. It was something I did every day. And so as I got kind of close to the neighborhood, even though I could never tell you the street names, I could never tell you right or left verbally, it just autopilot somewhere deep in the recesses of my brain took over, 
My brain went on autopilot and I was able to get to my house because habits are just that powerful. The habits you form, form you. Your habits are powerful. Your, your habits, they, they burrow down deep. Those little things you do every day that you think don't matter, they have this big impact on you. Our habits are powerful. Now, the power of habits can be a blessing or a curse. Have you seen this in your life, right? Have you ever tried to break a bad habit? That is hard, right? It's hard. Be a blessing or a curse, this power of habits. It can be a blessing because if you can establish a good and healthy habit, then you can be directed towards God. You can go on a good direction, even when you don't have the willpower to make that positive decision in that situation. God can lead you in that direction because your, your habits can actually overcome your lack of willpower. Or, or on the other side, though, if you form an unhealthy habit, if you form this unhealthy habit, even if you want to overcome it, even if you're like trying to muster all the willpower you've got in you, it's sometimes you don't have enough. Have you ever noticed that your willpower is actually not able to overcome a habit? If you've ever tried to break like a bad habit and you're like, I want to do this and you wake up, you're like, yeah, I didn't do it. I don't want to stop this. Yeah, I didn't stop it. You couldn't muster up enough willpower. That's because our habits are more powerful than our willpower. Our habits are more powerful than our willpower. This is how you can make sense out of this incredible and transparent and vulnerable verse that Paul gives us, where he says this about himself in Romans 7.15. If you've never heard this for us, it's, it's an amazing verse. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. What I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Do you feel with that? Right? Do you resonate with that some? That the stuff you want to do, you can't quite make yourself do it sometimes? And the stuff you're like, I'm never doing that again. Ow, did it again. Have you caught yourself doing that, right? Why in the world does that happen? Why can't you do the stuff you want to do? Why can't you live the life you want to live for God? And why do you keep doing the stuff that you don't want to do? It's because your willpower isn't enough. Your willpower isn't enough. Your willpower isn't. Our habits are actually more powerful than our willpower. This is why even Paul, even Paul struggled to do sins he knew he shouldn't do. Because habits are, are stronger than willpower. And I always tell myself, like, if Paul struggled with it, I am definitely going to struggle with it, right? We carry out our habits even when we're not thinking about them. Our brains, when we, when we have a habit, our brains go into autopilot. This is why habits have the power to overrule our own power, our own willpower, and as Paul says, get us to do stuff we don't want to do. I can't accomplish spiritual growth by trying harder. Have you noticed this? You can't just experience spiritual growth by going, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I bet I'm going to do better. It doesn't work. It's like saying tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and there's going to be a cookie in my pantry and I'm not going to eat it. Right? I have found that that never happens. Right? right? Your willpower isn't enough. Usually only a habit has the power to overcome habit. I cannot merely try harder tomorrow. I've got to train my habits if I want to transform more and more into the image of Christ as his disciple. Our habits are more powerful than our willpower. In fact, they're so powerful that habits can actually transform what you crave. God is not just interested in your actions. He's interested in what you long for and what you love and what your heart craves. Ephesians 4.22 says, Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. So why, why would care, God care about our desires? Not just our actions, but why does he care about our desires and what you long for and what you crave and what you want? Well, it's because often your desires and your cravings create who you are and what you do. So how do you, you, you think about these cravings? Well, in modern society, we have developed this false belief about what we crave. 
By what we crave, I mean like you have things you long for, right? You have things you want. You have things you desire. You have things you wish for. And in our modern society, we have become convinced that the source of our cravings is unknown and that we can't really change what we crave. So think about it like this. Uh, People would say, hey, why? Why did I fall in or out of love with them? Well, I don't know. I just, it's something in me. I can't change it, right? Why do I crave fudge rounds instead of a slice of salmon? It's because I was born with these taste buds. Why do I dislike my job? Well, I I just must not be made for it. As Emily Dickinson summed up in this mistaken feeling, she said, the heart wants what the heart wants. Isn't that the, the ethos of our society? That Whatever you want, whatever you crave, you can't really change it. You can't understand where it comes from. You can't alter it or reorient what you crave. And of course, this has a huge effect on our relationship with God as well. Because when it comes to God, you're like, okay, so if you're a disciple of Jesus, you, you want more of Jesus, right? But then you go through these seasons where you don't, where you have doubt or it feels dry. Have you ever been through a, a dry spiritual season? Man, I've been through some of those, right? And you're going through this, and you're, if you believe this cultural lie that you can't affect and reorient what you crave and what you want and what you desire, you'll look at God and go, I don't know why. I don't desire more of him. I don't know why right now I feel in this dry season. I don't know why I'm not craving more closeness with God. And I can't do anything about that. And so we lie to ourselves about growing our faith because, well, we don't think we can influence whether or not our heart actually craves wanting more of God. Our culture sees feelings and loves and desires and longings and cravings like a dog on a leash where... uh, we're the dog and we're getting pulled along by this leash, right? But these are lies. We want to be people who, like the psalmists, can say to God in Psalm 73, 25, earth has nothing I desire besides you. Isn't that awesome? Earth has nothing, has nothing I desire besides you. The truth is that you actually can reorient and affect what you crave in life. We can affect whether we desire more of God or not by changing our habits. Have you noticed this, that habits will actually make you long for something? Have you ever made a change in your habit and then like what you actually want changes? Think about it, like, have you ever, have you ever actually been able to get an exercise plan going? Have you ever done that, right? Okay, so you go for like a jog or for me, I don't jog, right? So... You go for like a bike ride one morning, you lift some weights and you feel good about it, right? So what happens? Do you want to, do you have that craving, that longing, that desire more the next day to exercise? Yeah, right? Because it felt good. Or if you wake up instead and you're like, I'm going to go get a donut this morning. You're like, oh, that was so good. You wake up the next morning like, I'm going to get a donut this morning, right? Because your habits, what you begin to do, what you begin to create as a routine will affect what you long for and what you crave. In the same way, if you create spiritual habits of spending time with God, spending time in prayer, spending time listening to the Holy Spirit, spending time in Scripture, if you create these spiritual habits, it'll actually change what you crave. You can change what you crave. The habit of spending time with God makes you crave more of God. What we crave, what we desire, what we long for, what we thirst after can be subtly reoriented towards the Lord through habits. Each of us can grow to crave more of God through establishing healthy spiritual habits. Habits can even change what you crave. Even change what you crave. Okay, so... If all of this power, if, the, if, if these habits have, if your habits have all of this power over you, and, and, and you know that they can even change what you crave, how do habits work? Well, our brains are wired. Your brain is wired to create habits because it saves your brain effort. Your brain is lazy, right? <laughs> That's why you have habits. That's why you have habits. You do, think about the, the habits you do, the actions you take that you don't need. I couldn't ask you, like, how did you back out of your garage this morning? Do you remember? Right? You probably don't. 
You have all, the, all these things. You back out of your garage. You do the dishes. You brush your teeth, hopefully. You tie your shoes, unless you're one of those Velcro people, which we should talk later. You turn on the TV. And you don't think about how to do this. It just happens. It just happens. These are habits. You don't even think about them. It just becomes this routine. Like, I have a routine. Yeah, I make myself coffee, but then I make my wife a latte every morning. Okay, so I wake up, get my coffee going, and then I make my wife a latte. And at first, I did not know what I was doing, right? Burned the milk, didn't get the grounds right. So I was watching YouTube because I learned everything on YouTube, apparently. And I had to figure out, like, the first times I was making coffee it would take forever because I was making this latte. And I'd be like, okay, how do I steam the milk? Or how do I grind the, 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 the coffee beans? And, and for how long? And, and what do I do? All these different things. And so at first, it took me a while. But now, at this point, I've been doing it for like a decade every morning. And so my brain just goes into autopilot. I don't even think about how to make my wife a latte, which is good because I'm a morning zombie. Like I'm barely conscious the first 30 minutes of the day. So what was a series of challenges now happens through automatic routine. What used to be a bunch of challenges and questions is now this automatic routine that I go through. This is why neurologists tell us that your brain activity, when something becomes a habit and you start that action of a habit, your brain activity actually decreases because your brain just kind of boop, goes into autopilot. The neurologists don't make that noise. Boop. They just, but that's what they say. And this automation is why it, habits are so important to disciples of Jesus. This is why we have to be so intentional about our habits because your habits are who you're becoming. And your habits take over. So when you get in a difficult situation, when you get in a stressful situation, when you get in kind of an intense moment, like what do you do in that situation? Well, you're going to react automatically based on your habits. And for the disciple of Jesus, the more we live out of the habits of Jesus, the more you're going to do what Jesus did in the situation. So if you take on the habits of Christ, you're going to do what Christ does in different situations. Now, how does this automation of habits happen? Well, thanks to some modern psychological research, we have some good, good ideas on this. And one theory is called the habit loop. And then I think this is kind of how you can make sense of how you can form new habits in your life, even spiritual habits. So the, uh, the, the first part of the habit loop starts with a cue. So you start with the cue. And that, not a line. We're not from England, right? It's just what you start. It's the cue, the cue. And that's the trigger that initiates the habit. So uh, some of us have habits with this thing. Have you noticed this, right? Who has a habit with this thing, right? The notification goes off and you're like, oh. And so th that's the cue, the notification goes off. And then you start a routine of you check the text and then somehow you're on Facebook and then somehow you're shopping on Amazon. And it's like a whole thing, right? Like you, you, the cue was the notification. It's what starts you into the habit. That's the cue. That's the cue. If you maybe seeing your Bible in your backpack cues you to open it and read it. Or, or maybe you, you come home and the cue of like opening the door when you get home from work cues you to go up and slump down and watch Netflix or go for a jog, okay? You have this, these cues in your life that start you into the habit. And now that the cue is present, your brain wants to automatically move into the routine. And the routine is the actual action itself. It's the sequence of actions that you go through for the habit. It's the automatic process. It's how you make the coffee. It's how you order your thoughts when you're praying. It's like where you sit and how you sit when you're watching TV. It's, it's how you read scripture for how long. It's how you brush your teeth, which, of course, is lower right, lower left, top right, top left, front, right? It's, it's the routine, okay? You have these routines. So you get cued in this routine, and you actually go through this process and steps. The routine is completed without you even thinking about it. And then third, you're rewarded. You find a reward. Sometimes you don't even know you're being rewarded. When I complete the routine of eating a candy bar, which, wow, Monday night was rough, okay? Halloween, all right? When you complete that routine of eating a candy bar or the routine of looking at social media, your brain releases dopamine, which 
rewards you with this feeling of pleasure. You're being rewarded for that routine. When you complete the routine of a workout, your your brain releases endorphins, which are going to lower your stress level, right? They're going to reward you with a lower stress level and a better mood. When you complete the routine of morning prayer and scripture reading, well, you're rewarded. You're rewarded with feeling a closeness to God and hopefully a, a peace as you start your day. For an action to become a habit, there has to be a reward on the other side. If you're penalized for it, you'll never do it again. You have to have that reward. And then fourth, the reward goes to craving. The reward grows my craving to repeat the routine. The reward is experienced during a habit. And then it grows my cravings. It grows my longings and it grows my desires. This is why if you can establish a habit, a spiritual habit in your life, it'll make you crave more and more and more of God. But it's because the, this habit loop, it creates cravings if you're rewarded. Chick-fil-A knows this about me, and it's a problem, right? So I'll go to Chick-fil-A, and I get a sandwich, which is delicious, right? And that's a reward in and of itself. And then ding, my phone comes up. I'm rewarded with 73 more Chick-fil-A red status points. Like, that's awesome, right? So I'm rewarded. And so, of course, what am I going to do? I'm going to have a craving to go back and have more Chick-fil-A. This is how it, how it how it works this is how our, our, our habits are formed. We, we have this reward that ends in this craving. If I'm rewarded with peace for spending time with God in the morning, well, I'm going to crave more and more spending time with God in the morning. So this is, this is the, the, the habit loop. The reward actually creates my craving to repeat the steps in the future every time I see the cue. Habits are formed through the habit loop of cue, routine, reward, and craving. So if these are these these habits that we have, which you have a lot of habits, right? I have a lot of habits. If these habits are that powerful, if these habits can even change what we crave, and if we understand how habits work, then how can we actually form some new habits? I mean, some of us, you know, we, we, we've wanted to, to form a habit of being in Scripture every day for like years, and we just we haven't been able to quite pull it off. And some of us, we're, we've been praying for years that we could really establish a time in our day where we could hear from the Lord and really rest in Him and, and have a, a better moment of prayer, and we haven't quite got there. So how do we form these new habits? You can do it. Ephesians 4, to 24 says, Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created, be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You can form new habits that will reform you. If you're a disciple of Jesus, this is, you can participate. You can help in this process of becoming the new self with your habits. So a couple of little, little things that really, really help if you want to form a new spiritual habit. Maybe you do want to read scripture every day. Maybe you do want to be in prayer every day. Wouldn't that be awesome to be able to meet with God in that way, to get more of God through those sorts of habits? Okay, so a couple of practical things. First, think about your cue. Remember, cues are what gets you into the habit loop. And so one of the things that's really helped me is is I actually take my physical Bible. I'm just old school like that, right? I like my physical Bible. And I'll I'll put it somewhere where I can see it, where I'll see it every day. And even just that, it'll cue the habit loop for me to go, oh, I need to read. I mean, that's so simple, right? Or, Or for me, one of the things has been I took the Bible app and I put it right in the middle of the front page of my phone. And that'll, you know, when I'm taking the kids to school, when I bring up my phone, I'm like, oh, there we go. It accuses me. It's something that, that I can see that helps me get in to the, to the loop that, that, of that habit. Something that, that, that initiates the thought that reminds me, because, man, I need reminders. I need reminders. Or if you want to start a morning prayer each time, if you, if you cue yourself with setting your alarm and kind of go into the same spot in your house, Every day, like that will cue you into prayer. So think about your cues. Also, think about your routines and making them as small as possible when they begin. Contrary to what we often think, establishing a brand spanking new routine requires you to lower your threshold. Lower your threshold. So let me put it like this. A lot of times we get really pumped up. 
okay, when we want to start a new routine. It's like on July 2nd, some of us are going to go to the gym and we're going to be like, I'm going to bench 300 pounds today, right? Like, dude, your, your arms are going to break. You're going to end up in the hospital. <laughs> That's not going to go well for you, right? So what you want to do is you want to lower your threshold for success. So if you've never established a routine of reading scripture every day, do, do it. it. It's amazing. Being in God's word every day, I don't know if there's anything that's changed my life like that. No habit. I mean, being in God's word every day, there, there's no habit in the world that's better. I love it. And if you want that, don't start by going, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read all of Genesis and Exodus today, right? Like, I'm going to read 60 chapters. Don't, don't start there. Start small. You know what? If I can read one chapter today, if I can even read one story today, that's going to be awesome. That's going to be awesome. Psychologists tell us this, that you have a, a better chance of establishing a habit if you lower the threshold of success. Because if you say, I'm going to read 60 chapters, and then you read one, you're like, oh, well, I failed, right? And you're not going to experience, remember the, the habit loop? You're not going to experience the reward. And so you're not going to crave to do it again because nobody wants to do something they failed at. Like if you don't get the reward, you're not going to establish the habit. So make sure, and particularly if you're just beginning in something like scripture reading, that, that you lower the threshold and start small so you can experience that reward. And it is rewarding to spend time in God's word every day. Same in prayer, right? There have been times when I'm like, oh, I got to get back to prayer, and, and tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up, I'm going to set my alarm, and I'm going to pray for an hour. And then you wake up and you're like, oh. Five minutes pass, it's like, I, th I think the dishes need to be done. And then you're done, right? And you feel like you failed. You didn't fail. You got up and prayed. Good for you. But you're going to feel failure. So instead, have a realistic expectation. Lower that threshold, and you'll be able to create that habit. You'll be more likely to, reward your, to feel rewarded spiritually and establish that habit for the next day. And then ultimately, you'll be able to increase the time you're in Scripture, increase the time you're praying over time as, again, the habit forms that craving in you to read Scripture, pray, listen to the Holy Spirit, do these spiritual, these, these, these spiritual disciplines more and more and more. And then finally, make the reward of the habit really clear and motivating to you. So a lot of times, I think, when we go to prayer, we have the wrong reward in mind. We're like, okay, I have to pray every day, so we think we're going to be rewarded by a little checklist, or oh, i got to just tell God everything I want him to do, which it's not all going to happen. Sorry to tell you that, right? And so we don't feel rewarded. But instead, if you go to the Lord in prayer every morning, and this is, this is, this is how I like to go to prayer. Lord, I am here to be with you. Is he there? Yeah. And so you're going to be rewarded with his presence. You're going to be rewarded with being with him. If you're just like, God, I want to be here with you now, that is clear and motivating. So you can form new habits, and those new habits will reform you. You can form new habits, new spiritual habits. Lower your threshold. Have really clear, really clear reward really cleared goal that's motivating for you. And think about your cues, even around your house, of where you put things. So how about you? If you're a disciple of Jesus, do you want transformation? I mean, that's what a disciple is, right? This is what we talked about last week. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you should want spiritual growth to be closer to the Lord, spiritual transformation, know him more and more. But how do you get there? I think a lot of times we fail to grow in our faith, not because we don't want to grow, but because we don't know how to grow. This is how you train yourself to transform, is you change the habits that you've established in your life. You get rid of some of these neutral and negative habits, and you replace them with healthy spiritual habits that are going to point you more and more and more towards Jesus and are going to get you more and more and more closer to the image of Christ that he wants to put within you. We can do this. You can form these new habits. Have you ever noticed in your life, some of us have been Christians for, uh, for, for years, some of us were still figuring out faith, but have you ever noticed, maybe if you've been a disciple of Jesus for a while, that the seasons where you felt closest to God were also, they just happened to be, the seasons of life where you had established the, the best spiritual habits? I can see this so clearly in my life. 
You know, years ago, when it was when I was a freshman in college, when, really when I figured out faith for myself. And two years later, I went on this trip. I went overseas, and I lived in a van, which is a different story, right? So living in a van, all of my old habits were gone. I didn't have any technology, didn't have a phone with me. So like habits of wasting a bunch of time on a phone, habits of, of, of just like sitting down and vegging out uh, at front of the TV at night, they were gone. They were gone. I had a habit before that of watching Conan O'Brien every night. It was gone, right? No more Conan. Not when you're living in a van. Not, you know, no more, no more uh, uh, a habit of, of scrolling on the phone. All these habits, they just went away. And then I got to make new habits. And Okay, so I don't sleep well. But when you live in a van, you kind of tend to fall asleep when the sun goes down, which for me meant I was waking up at like 4 a.m. every morning. And so I wake up at 4 and be like, what in the world do I do with myself? So first I started just reading scripture and praying and then pausing to be present with the Lord and just listen for like 20, 30 minutes, okay? And over a couple weeks, I just wanted more and more and more of that because your habits really do create your cravings. And so by about a month of doing that, I had this habit of just being with the Lord for like two hours a morning. Now I'd like to say I still do that. I do not, okay, I don't have the time. But it was this awesome season of just establishing this amazing habit of getting to be alone with the Lord. And wouldn't you know it that that just happened to be the same season of life when God did so much in me. Like that was the season of life where my faith, like it truly took off. That was a season of life where God really directed my attention towards Megan, my wife. That was a season of life where I felt called to ministry. Like so much intense stuff happened in this one semester, this one season of life. And it wasn't about a trip. It wasn't about doing anything. It was just about the habits, just the spiritual habits that that were in my life. I can look back, I bet you can look back and you can see that in your life too, right? That the the seasons of life where you had those spiritual habits in place, man, that was the best season. It was when you heard the Holy Spirit the clearest. It was when you felt the closest to God. But then there's been other seasons where I I haven't had those habits. There's been a couple seasons where I was like, I moved and then I was working too much and, and some of those habits fell to the wayside. And once you know it, that's when, you know, some doubt and those dry seasons, those spiritual valleys, like that's when that took place for me often. And it was all habits. It was those habits that we form. Spiritual transformation takes training your habits. Spiritual transformation takes training your habits. And here's the thing. I know we all want to do big stuff for the Lord. I hope you do, right? I know we want to do big stuff in your life. We want to have these these big accomplishments for the Lord. We have these, these big dreams that we have for our life, but it doesn't start there. It starts with the little things. Blaise Pascal said, small minds are concerned with the extraordinary, great minds with the ordinary. Do you want to know Lord more? Do you want to accomplish great things for him? Awesome. Start reading your Bible tomorrow for five minutes. You want to do big, great things? Great, great, great. Spend 10 minutes tomorrow just quiet in front of the Lord, hearing from his spirit. You want to do something? You want to start some ministry? You want want to help your neighbor come to the Lord? You want to help change your neighborhood? Great. That's huge. That's good. That's awesome. Pray. Just establish the little habits that'll change who you are and what you do over time. Don't just dream about the extraordinary. Get involved in the ordinary, the little habits. Change your habits and you'll change your faith. Spiritual transformation takes training our habits.